Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health is a not-for-profit group of hospitals and medical clinics caring for surrounding communities. Their nurses, physicians, and staff are nationally recognized for their remarkable devotion to patient care. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. In reflection of this country's ongoing and certainly widespread political dissension and broader lack of industrial sector leadership, someone said recently that, you know, there just needs to be a parent in charge. You know, an honest broker, so to speak, a person that can referee and help us separate the shrill accusation from the facts worth knowing. Well, welcome back to the most widely watched dialogue on Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William, and on this edition of CBR, a late season look at tourism some economic policy, and the sports industry marquee game of golf. John McConnell joins us later. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte, enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded October 21st, 2011. On this week's program, Brad Dean of the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber of Commerce, Berkeley Young of Young Strategies, Inc., and special guest, John McConnell, CEO of McConnell Golf, LLC. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program. Uh, gentlemen, Berkeley, good to have you here. And Brad, uh, nice to see you again. Uh, Brad, I want to start with you. You know, how do we get past this? And it certainly is most obvious in the political realm, but how do we get past this, 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 this dialogue uh, that's going on in, in, in communities and, and on the public about, you know, the, the political polarization, the finger pointing and the shrill accusations. How do we get back to a respectful debate? How do we do that? You know, Chris, to call what we're seeing today a dialogue is really, uh, that's a compliment because all too often it's an argument. You see it at the elected level of federal and state. Uh, we're talking at each other, not to each other. I think a lot of politicians and community leaders as well forget the good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. That's to listen twice as much as we speak. And unfortunately, what you see is we've always had political differences from the, from the outset of this nation, but we've always had leaders who were willing to step beyond, listen, compromise, not compromise principles, but compromise on goals so that we can move forward. We're not seeing that in Washington. We're challenged to see it at the state and sometimes the local level. And I don't think we get there until we stop focusing on the past and look to the future. Uh, as we move forward as a nation, as, as a region, and certainly as individual states and communities, the only way you get there is focusing on how we're going to operate, grow, and prosper in this new economic environment that is truly a worldwide economy. And we can't continue to do what we've done in the past and hope to prosper in the future. So, so where, I guess, where is the tipping point? Where, Berkeley, where do we find the leader that's willing to say, you know what, it's not a... I'm not looking for credit. I'm not looking to place blame. I'm just looking to try to move the ball forward. Well, I think it's interesting. If you look back at the Great Depression, we didn't have the level of media saturation that we have now. And, and now if I just go to a simple cocktail party, the level of dialogue is almost to the point that you're like watching Crossfire. And I think to a certain extent we may have become talk nation instead of work nation. And I think there's a lot to be said for people just getting together and finding the common ground that you mentioned. You know, in South Carolina for years, we had Fritz Hollings and Strom Thurmond, who were clearly political opposites, who were able to find common ground, work together, and compromise. And, and I think that's what it takes, is getting back to work and, and a little less talk and a little more work. Do you think the technology for our dialogue, then, do you think that we've, our, our technology for our dialogue is way beyond what our maturity level to handle all of this information? 
Well, we certainly have allowed it to become a, a tool against people as opposed to for progress. Uh, but, Chris, I think that's where leaders have to step up and take some responsibility. Uh, I've seen at the local and state level some of the best leaders we have are people who aren't just in the political arena. They've managed a business. They understand what it means to make payroll, to create jobs. And when you know what you're trying to accomplish and you can move forward in those, go, in those realms with, by bringing people together, then you don't have to worry about what the bloggers and the anonymous critics say. But when we allow that what to happen, what Berkeley's talking about is where you become argumentative and everything is about what he said, she said, or what did or didn't happen, you quit focusing on what's really important to people, and that's how do we move our communities, our state, and our nation forward? How do we create jobs? How do we protect our nation and our interests without attacking each other? And there, there's a role to the dialogue. Uh, Will Rogers once said that bad news is halfway around the world before good news has his pants on good. And, and there's something to be said for that. And I think, to the, the partnership among civic leaders and our politicians, leadership's not always following the poll and doing the popular thing. And sometimes it's making the painful decision. And yes, that may mean you're a one-termer, that in hindsight, many of the great leaders that we respect now when we look back were not popular at the time and may have even not been reelected. Are, are, you, are either one of you encouraged that we're going to get back to that, that someone will stick their head out of the foxhole, get it shot off first, but willing to take, you know, kind of take that bullet? Well, I think today we're going to interview somebody who, who stepped out and did something very different in an industry mm -hmm. and, and broke out of the mold and, and took it in a different direction. And, and let's talk about tourism. L late in the season, you know, the fall, fall probably, I don't know, how is fall down at the beach? You know, normally the mountains in the Carolinas do well, but what, what happens down there? You know, fall for us in the Myrtle Beach area is largely golf groups and weekend getaways. And we've maintained a, a strong presence in each of those. The yield in the golf industry is not what we would like. It's not what anybody in the golf industry would like. Uh, but we're actually holding our own and seeing some modest growth. Perhaps the best sign, Chris, we've seen this year is not only growth in the entertainment sector, the sports sector, the lodging sector, and the general business environment, we're actually starting to see prices level out and come back. We're not seeing huge price gains, but you know when your business community is able to modestly increase prices, there's confidence in there that we're holding market share and actually perhaps gaining some business. That's a very, very good sign as the Carolinas hope to emerge from this recession stronger and better than other regions. Yeah, you know, Berkeley, when what can, clearly tourism is the largest industry in both North and South Carolina. What, I mean, how can that industry take a leadership role as we battle with budget? State tax collections yeah. are going up, but clearly not as much as we'd like. So what does tourism, what does the economic well, and, development and, and, and one thing off the bat, the, the term travel industry is important because many times when you say tourism, small communities out there are thinking, we don't have tourism yeah, here. Yeah. But every day they have business travelers that come there, people that come for meetings, a courthouse, a hospital. They drive overnight visitation that puts people in hotel rooms. And, and a lot of money is invested in every county in these two states. So the travel industry is a big driver, and, and the elected officials have to appreciate the economic impact of it because a lot of times you can go into a community and talk about tourism, and they don't even realize they have it. And, and it's that travel industry that they've got to embrace. So the travel industry is becoming much more unified in each state and in most states around the country it going after some of the political issues that are out there right now. You know, Chris, I think Berkeley hit it on the head. Tourism is a huge, huge generator of cash. In South Carolina, tourism is a cash machine. Unfortunately, some elected officials think it's an ATM because they only see the money coming out and they right. forget a small, modest investment in tourism doesn't just benefit hotels and restaurants. It is a huge job creator. It funds schools and, and nonprofit organizations. And any economic developer in the Carolinas that doesn't think tourism is an opportunity Maybe we need to put smokestacks on top of the hotels and make them feel a little better about it. The bottom line That's is right. tourism is bringing money into our communities. It's creating jobs that won't be outsourced. And it may be one of the best bets we have in the short term to grow state and local revenues. Oh, okay, in, in the less than the last minute left, how can we get uh, more of a focus, more of a serious consideration for transportation dollars and infrastructure dollars? You know, uh, when you've got education out there, Berkeley, right. saying, no, 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 we've got to invest in the kids. They've got a point. How do, you, how do you make the case for Well, and, and, and truly, it's the roads or the arteries that bring people in. And, and our total infrastructure is so critical, but the travel industry is not united. The hotel industry in each state has its association, and the restaurant 
industry has its association, and then there's a straight state travel association. When those three become united to make the case that one of the best ways to fund schools and education and health care and, and law enforcement in a community is to bring outside money in, and you can do it through broad economic development, factories, et cetera, or you can bring in visitors, conventions, meetings every day, and, and that becomes important. But it also means that you can have laws passed in each state that hurt the travel industry and keep people away. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of laws in each state that get passed and, and you have to understand their effect on the travel industry because many conventions will stay away if they see a state as having regressive laws. So then how, how do you get past just, Brad, to use your example, you want stuff in Myrtle Beach, you want stuff on the Grand Strand, but how do you get past, is it just public policy that's keeping you from helping Charleston out, or maybe even Wilmington? Well, certainly when you talk about transportation infrastructure, Chris, you have to keep in mind that the projects we all need and want do not limit themselves along city and county lines. When you start thinking about political boundaries is usually when things start to fall apart. What we have to do is a better job, both as advocates in our communities, our elected leaders, local, state, and federal level, and the average citizen is recognized over the last 50 years, no investment by the federal government has created more jobs or done more for our economy than investments in infrastructure. And if we look at it today, whether it's the port, whether it's new interstates or highway repair, or just simple common sense investments in infrastructure, these are very much needed to create the jobs we need right now. If we could become energy independent, and start investing some of those savings that we're sending to countries like China right here in the Carolinas, we would create way more jobs than anybody has the room to fill right now. But until we connect infrastructure with jobs, I don't know that our elected officials will get there on their own. Okay, Redistribution that, that, will be important. In redistribution? The redistribution because the Essential Air Service Act, if they eliminate the funding of a lot of small airports, you could see a major redistribution of how people arrive in the Carolinas to do business. Okay, you know, hold on to that, Berkeley, because that, 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 that's a point that we certainly need to drill down on. Uh, that'll be the last word for now. Next week on this program, talk about jobs. There is a small company in the Statesville, North Carolina area called K Kiwani Scientific adding jobs and making capital investment. We'll find out why and how uh, a laboratory furniture business is flourishing. Bill, uh, Bill Shoemaker from Kiwani Scientific uh, next week on this program. And then in two weeks, Peter Carmanos, the owner and the manager and clearly one of the biggest cheerleaders of the 2000, was it 2006? I think 2006 Stanley Cup Carolina Hurricanes, he'll be here. Our special mm -hmm. guest is, uh, is a guy that seems to defy the conventional wisdom of if it's not a recession, it sure feels like one. After selling two successful healthcare startups, he deployed that capital toward building a network of premier golf courses, names like Raleigh Country Club, Sedgefield in Greensboro, the Reserve on the Grand Strand, Old North State up on North Carolina's Baden Lake, Cardinal Golf and Country Club in the Triangle, Treyburn and, Tri and, and its latest trophy course, TPC Wakefield Plantation. Joining us now, owner of McConnell Golf, uh, John McConnell. John, do you like to play golf? Uh, every day, Chris, if I could. <laughs> I, would, I would have never guessed that. It, uh, congratulations. Uh, thanks for being back on the program, John. Um, John, before we go down this uh, road about your business, we were talking here about some leadership issues. The, the dialogue that goes on in, in public, in, in communities, at cocktail parties, in, in, within companies, how do we get this dialogue to be a little bit more respectful and level-headed? How do we get to that, that place? I think uh, these gentlemen touched on it, uh, the media uh, awareness that we have today uh, and every, all the special interests wanting their uh, you know, piece of the pie, so to speak, it creates uh, uh, difficulty for politicians. And I look at my eight-year-old son, every time I ask him to go do something, his standard answer is, what's in it for me, Dad? And I think uh, that uh, typifies a lot of the constituents out that politicians have to serve today. And I think the best way to solve uh, a lot of our com uh, country's ills is to go back and look at what can we do for the country, not what mm -hmm. can it do for us every day. Don't expect Washington or Raleigh, et cetera, to solve every problem we have. And number two, term limits. If you can't get these guys out of office and not having them run for re-election every two years, we'll never fix this problem going forward. And they, you know, many of the politicos will agree offline about that. And we all agree about it in, in public forums like this. 
Why can't we move the ball to that point? I think a lot of uh, politicians want to stay uh, in their current assignments yeah. because of the influence, power, et cetera. But, you know, I serve on a couple of uh, public boards, and I've always said the first two years you learn about the company, the next two years you really can help the company, and then the next four years uh, it's time to start thinking about bringing someone else in with a fresh uh, slate of ideas and, and things because the countries change. Uh, the country changes and companies change. So it's always good to have fresh uh, input coming into the organization at the leadership level. And, and, and just one more question around this. And since you're, uh, you are a corporate director and you have built a couple of companies, more than a couple of companies now, it, it, someone had noted recently and I read a book and it doesn't, can't recall the, the title of it, but the whole thesis of the book was that the government sector does not have a way of creative destruction, that they just continue to grow and there's no creative way for them to, uh, you know, cut headcount and redeploy assets in those growth industries. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Uh, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, in the business world, uh, we tended to make uh, each manager justify uh, a hiring decision. And I, I'm convinced today the only way we're going to control government is peg their revenues, uh, or I call it expenditures, at a percent of GMP or, or, or some number where that's the budget, that's all you get. And then I think they can make the tougher decisions that they all need to make. Mm -hmm. Brad. You know, it's a sad commentary, and, and John's obviously right, but how bad is it to think that the only way we can control our government is to say you can only grow this much, whereas in the business world, you control it real simply. Every good business is zero-based budgeting, and you make decisions upon what's best uh, in the short term, long term, and reinventing yourself, and unfortunately, uh, in this environment, that doesn't happen in government. John, you've been in industries that are heavily regulated, I mean, from the medical industry, and you're now seeing perhaps different kinds of regulation, and we've seen in South Carolina with the NLRB and what they've done to Boeing and uh, the banking reform. Uh, it just seems like government works against business, not for business. Any solutions that you've seen from the industries you've been in or down the line that what could help us create more jobs in the Carolinas? Well, I've, I've spent 30 some years in healthcare and it's obviously the biggest waste of money of any industry I've ever been involved in or uh, et cetera. Uh, there are billions of dollars to be saved in healthcare and but no one takes the leadership position to do that. Uh, other industries, the golf industry, I mean we, we get a tremendous amount of regulations on uh, on things we can do. You know, the, the water, how much water we get, uh, pesticides we can use, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, OSHA, I mean, uh, you know, having to deal with, uh, uh, you know, those type of regulations as a small business owner now, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's a cost to doing business, which means any cost I have, I have to pass on to my uh, members, and, you know, so that's not something that we're excited about. Do you expect a level of compliance for OSHA, for example? Is that only going to go up? Uh, I am hopeful that in the present climate, we're going to cap out regulation. I think the average business owner, average employee now understands that uh, government may hurt us more than help us. I mean, yeah, we, we needed to fix some of the, uh, the issues, uh, the smokestacks and environment and so forth. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think uh, a lot of those were good ideas, but, you know, you got to remember, uh, I recently had, uh, was doing some small work up at Sedgefield. We moved some dirt and we moved it over within 100 yards of a stream. Uh, someone reported us that we didn't have, you know, a flood, f or whatever you call it, the a runoff fence, fence that, around that it. it you know, the the and this was a temporary thing. I get a two-page letter from some official at the city of Greensboro that if we don't do this, this, and that, you know, we can have these tremendous fines, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going, okay, that person has a job. I should be respectful of that, but do we really need that person? You know, so I mean, and, and so I'm sure everybody sees that on a daily basis, getting building permits. Uh, you know, I'm not sure our uh, government officials are incentivized to make it easy mm -hmm. on its customer. John, tell me, you were a businessman who loved golf. Now you're in the golf business. How has it changed your perception of golf, and where do you see your business model going, having made that transition? Uh, interesting idea, because uh, in the old days, uh, 
I played golf to get away from my business issues. <laughs> so uh, it was truly my hobby. Yeah. And today I've taken a hobby and now I sweat when I drive in to <laughs> one of our clubs going, I smell burning cash. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a great business, a great industry. And all I can say when I look back on my life, uh, what mistakes I might have made early in my 20s, my 30s, is I work too hard and then play enough golf. So are you working from your head or your heart? Uh, we've moved from the heart to the head, but we still have a lot of heart involved mm -hmm. because it's a passionate uh, uh, sport. Uh, the members, uh, you know, people that work in the hospitality, uh, entertainment industry, such as golf, uh, they're not the highest paid individuals in the world, and they have a true love of what they do every day. And that's the thing that motivates me the most is watching these young golf pros who you know, work 80 hours a week and they just, they're there for the love of the game and, and helping and making people uh, have a great experience. And, and here you are, you're talking from your heart about the game of golf, but you've got to look at it a little bit more clinical. Musgrove Mill in the upstate part of South Carolina, Clinton, South Carolina, you've had to make a hard decision. How, how do, John, I guess, how do you take the romantic part of golf out and say, okay, Musgrove Mill, we're losing, we're losing money, it's not working, I'm either going to shut it down or saw, uh, mothball it. You mothballed it. When do you make the decision to either put it back online or say, it's not going to work, we're going to have to close it completely? I think uh, the next two months will help us make that uh, long-term decision because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that there will be some new ideas introduced for that property from either members or from outside uh, you know, uh, ma uh, corporations or, or other people that have a better idea to make that beautiful golf course successful more than I have. It's one of the top golf courses I've ever played, and it's very sad. Uh, I've had two tough business decisions in my life. One was to lay off 10 people, and closing that golf course is number two. John, this industry has not necessarily grown on the top line, and in some respects <laughs> it's, it's declined, and, and yet it's an industry that's struggled to maintain its yield, even at times of, of, of good economic prosperity. Uh, you've got to have a certain yield to be able to sustain the quality of golf that you and others are accustomed to. How do you manage that and drive that forward, especially in this economic environment where everybody's just wrestling for that last dollar that, uh, that might keep them afloat? Uh, great questions. I think that historically golf has been too expensive. Uh, the courses, to build courses, uh, take millions of dollars. Uh, the good news for McConnell Golf is we can buy the replacement cost for pennies on the dollar. So we're coming into these projects uh, at a lot less uh, capital uh, needed to, to maintain the courses, which is beneficial for the, the you know, I call it the, the yield. And secondly, uh, I think that we can capture some, a lot of the younger generation. Right now, they've been in soccer, they've been on bikes, uh, they're in very active sports, they're, you know, they're sitting in there uh, playing the pin, whatever you call it, the video games, et cetera. We need to get them outside. And I think when you see uh, kids like Webb Simpson winning millions of dollars, and then you watch the Carolina Panthers uh, on Sunday and see how tough it is to play football and how many injuries those guys get and how short their career paths are, I'm going, why would you not want to play golf? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's a great sport. And more importantly, golf teaches kids a discipline, accountability, because who else is there to blame when you hit a bad shot? Mm -hmm. Yourself. That's why I like it. And I, I, I think when people try to decide how to spend their leisurely time and, and what to invest in, uh, you know, from a recreational standpoint, I've got two words for him. Sam Ruby. He's a member of Raleigh Country Club. He's 98 years old. He comes out to the golf course and plays every day. Name me one other sport that will keep you physically fit and that you can enjoy from three years old when Tiger started it to 98 where, where Mr. Ruby is today. Why would you not play? Hey, I'm going to quote you. I've got a brother who's never taken credit for his bad shots. He's <laughs> always put it off on others. You know, my dad once and quipped. Yeah, we, we're going to have to cut you off because we're almost out of time. So I, I wish I'd give you another shot here because, you know, you guys have been great to do it. Berkeley, thank you for being thank on you. the program. Brad, always nice to have you up on Pleasure. the beach. 
Uh, John, just very quickly in about 10 seconds, would you expect to see a turn in this economy sooner rather than later now, or has it come? Uh, one of my friends told me, John, uh, you're in the perfect business because you're the first check they quit writing, and you're the uh, last check they start writing again when the economy improves. I can tell you we're past the recession. We're now seeing positive growth because our membership roles are increasing and our downgrades and memberships have declined. Thank you, John. Good night. Major funding for Carol that was a good was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte, enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health is a not-for-profit group of hospitals and medical clinics caring for surrounding communities. Their nurses, physicians, and staff are nationally recognized for their remarkable devotion to patient care. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.